Pastor Les, thanks so much for joining us this morning for our online experience. Again, we hope that you and your family are safe at home and making the most of your time in quarantine. I thank God that Cebu is still on GCQ, praying that all of you will follow the rules and are staying healthy during this season. So if today is your first time joining us, we're so glad you're here. Our mission here at Quest is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We hope more than anything that you enjoy today's broadcast and maybe even hear something uplifting or helpful for this season in your life. But most especially, we pray that you will have a personal relationship with Christ. 
This morning, Pastor Les is going to continue on our series, Five Things God Uses to Grow Your Faith. Faith is just not positive thinking, but faith is about trusting in God that God is who He says He is. We also learned how a growing faith helps us in our day-to-day -day lives. So take out a pen and a piece of paper and take notes because you don't want to forget the five things God uses to grow your faith. So here's Pastor Les with the final part of today's series. Well, we're wrapping up our series this morning on the five things that God uses to grow our faith. Remember, we started two weeks ago and we talked about this whole idea of how God wants us to have a big faith. And I think we would want that for ourselves too, especially in the midst of a time like this when, you know, things are uncertain, things are constantly changing. They've been a bit scary. And so what would it look like to have a big faith that when things happen, that we just realize God's still there, God's still in control, and we can trust Him and life goes on. You know, we see that in somebody else and we're like, I want that for myself. I, I wish I could have that. And so we said, God wants you to have it. We're going to talk about how you can have it. And the great thing is, not only does it benefit us, but when we have a big faith, we looked at a passage a couple weeks ago where, you know, God is incredibly honored too when we show that we have a big faith. And so last week we unpacked the first three of the five things. Remember, they were practical teaching, uh, private disciplines, and providential relationships. Just kind of a, as a recap, private, uh, I'm sorry, practical teaching is, you know, being in environments where you heard the Bible, the teachings of Jesus taught in a way that was different. It, it just kind of connected with your life. It was, there was application uh, because we feel like you know, that is what changes a person's life. That's one of the things God uses to grow our faith. We, we gave that example of a, a can of paint and a can of paint is useless until you take the can of paint out of the can and put it on the wall because as Lane Jones said that um, unapplied truth is really like unapplied paint because the value is actually in the application. So practical teaching was one. We talked about private disciplines. Private disciplines are those things that we do typically in private, but things like learning how to pray, uh, reading our Bible, um, the practicing the discipline of giving and seeing God work in our finances. And the big thing there, which you know goes with the prayer and the Bible reading, is I cannot um, underemphasize the uh, or I, I can't overemphasize rather the the importance of having a daily time that you just kind of stop and that's the time you know as a believer that you have with God and you know he's not there but you're you're just sitting there and you're maybe being quiet for part of that meditating reading your bible praying oh my goodness that will explode your faith so private disciplines is one and the last one we talked about is providential relationships which all you can really do is put yourself in an environment where that can happen. But those are the things where it's like somebody showed up in my life and it was like they appeared out of nowhere. You know, I got this job and I didn't even know this person, but they really had um, a big impact on growing my faith. It was providential. It was a God thing. And, you know, we need to also be available to be that providential relationship for other people because I think God wants to also use us in that way. So today we're going to unpack the last two. The One of them is kind of applies to what we're in right now because there are always things or events or situations that happen in our life that we look back and say, you know what, I think God was in that. Or maybe God was trying to show me or teach me something. And we call those pivotal relationships because you know, either they just happened or maybe sometimes God orchestrated them, but that happened, you you look back and it can be a positive thing. It might be something like the birth of a child. Um, you know, you, you know, started dating or got married to a person of faith. Maybe, you know, you had some success, you've got this new job or new career, but typically it's not those positive situations. I mean, God can use 
a, a positive thing as a pivotal circumstance to grow your faith, but more often than not, it's the ones that kind of stretch our faith. It's the, you know, death in the family, the illness, the crisis, because, you know, when we're healthy and when we're successful and things are going well, usually God's not the first thing on our mind, but when things are pretty rough, God usually has a chance to get our attention a bit more. Uh, like, we're in the middle of COVID-19. In fact, all of us are in the middle of COVID-19. You know, I think that that very possibly could be a pivotal circumstance that we look back someday and say, gosh, that was hard, you know, being quarantined for so many months and, you know, the, the fear that came with it, the anxiety, all those things, the financial challenges. But God used that time to, to grow my faith in a way that, you know, probably could never happen before. Well, there's, um, there's a quote that C.S. Lewis said in his book, The Problem of Pain. And, and this is kind of how he described it. He said that God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts to us in our pain. That pain is God's megaphone to rouse or awaken a deaf world. I mean, the Bible teaches us that events, um, circumstances, especially negative ones, can, can be a test and of our faith. They can strengthen our faith, and they can even launch our faith. In fact, the brother of Jesus, James, comes right out and says this. He says that, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, he doesn't say if, he says when, because they will, um, consider it an opportunity for great joy, which... We don't normally think of problems as joyful, but he said it's perspective. It's all how you frame it. He said, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So here's kind of the progression of it. You, you have a, a trial, a, a difficulty in your life. That trial, if you look at it, it can be a, a test of your faith. And, and through that test of faith, you develop perseverance. And when your perseverance is developed and maturing, your faith grows. So that's how God uses those things. Um, you've probably heard of this story before, but let me tell you pieces of it. And it's from uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 11. It says this, a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. I mean, the story is full of drama and conflict and all of this. And, but when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Well, that was kind of different, you know, that God is glorified through sickness. I mean, that's a different way of looking at things. But l l let me continue. He says that, so although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, but it didn't seem like it by what he was about to do, um, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Jesus ended up doing exactly what we would have not expected him to do. Finally, he said to the disciples, let's go back to Judea. But his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going to go there again? I mean, these disciples could have edited the story before it got in our Bibles and made themselves look a little bit better, but they ended up looking like cowards because they were just normal people. In fact, sounds like to me that they were a lot more concerned about their own safety than they were about the safety of Jesus. Well, Jesus continues. He says, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'll, now I'll go and wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he will soon get better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died, so he just told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And so they were confused. Well, wait a minute. Um, you love him, but you let him die? And just now? After this, you're going to go back? Jesus says something, and it gets even a little bit stranger. He says, and for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. I mean, for, for our sakes? I mean, what about for Lazarus' sakes? And 
sake and and uh and you're glad i mean why why would you be glad and he tells us he says because now you will really believe come let's go see him because see in god's eyes and in god's economy um, circumstances pain and tragedy are things that god can use to build up a person's faith so they arrive and lazarus sister comes out to meet them and says kind of what you would expect her to say and respond. She, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But now I know that, but even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. So she knows that Jesus has this direct connection with God, that Jesus, if anybody can get to God, Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha, he will rise when Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises on the last day. Jesus told her, I'm the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, even after dying, will live. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? So he's kind of getting to the point that all of this pain and this tragedy, this turmoil, is really about their faith. Yes, Lord, she told him, I've always believed that you're the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who's come into the world from God. And then Jesus asked to be taken to the grave. And it tells us he stood there, and the verse says that Jesus wept. And the people who were standing nearby said, see how much Jesus loves him? I mean, all this drama leading up to it, the pain, the emotion, the tragedy, and you probably know what happens. Jesus performs this miracle, raises Lazarus from the dead. He walks out of the tomb, and how does everybody respond? It says many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. You know, the thing that you cannot miss in this story is the connection between these horrible, tumultuous events and the issue of faith. Because John and Jesus make sure that we don't miss it. We don't have to guess what this story is about. It's very, very clear. And in fact, in this case, Jesus didn't just leverage a circumstance to make it pivotal that was already there. He actually created one in this case. But either way, whether it's created or, or it just happens, the pivotal circumstances introduce God into the conversation, and oftentimes they introduce God into our lives. They make us reconsider what we've really put our faith in. They make us think about who's in control. They, they give us a healthy sense of dependence on God. But you know what? It's our response that makes all the difference. And the thing that has the biggest um, uh, impact on our response is the people that are around us. Because when we have people around us and a pivotal circumstance hits, then we have people that can help us to see that situation for what it really is, to maybe see God in that situation and to help us process it properly. People that you know give up on faith are usually the people that didn't have um, healthy friendships around them to help them frame that situation for what it, it really was. Uh, the author Philip Yancey says this, he says, the only thing worse than disappointment with God is disappointment without God. I mean, this story of Lazarus assures us that God is not absent, that he is very present, that he has not left the building, um, and he's building in us a big faith in him. You know, I know sometimes it feels like God is actually doing something to us. And when we feel that way, and when we have that perspective, the tendency is we might lose faith. But when we realize that God is very possibly doing something in us, that's when our faith grows. Um, as I said, I, I just think that this whole COVID-19 thing could be a pivotal circumstance in all of our lives that we can look back and... Um, when all of this is past and this is all history to see the the parts in that story maybe not the whole thing but at least pieces in it that god used it to to grow us uh, a really really big faith in him 
Well, the last thing that we're going to look at today is the idea of personal ministry. And personal ministry is when you are in a situation where you're stepping out of your comfort zone, you're, you've maybe been asked or you feel led to do something to, to serve, and uh, you, people usually say things like, you know, I felt so unqualified. I didn't feel like I was ready. I didn't feel like I was the right person for that. I was praying so hard and I felt like God showed up and, and it was just so awesome. I mean, they, you know, people hear about a need or they, you know, they just had this opportunity and, and God shows up in it. You may have seen that. Maybe you've been involved in a service opportunity. Maybe it was one of our Give, Serve, Love projects and you think, wow, you know, that's kind of new for me. I'll try that. And you went out there and you think, wow, I went out there to be a blessing and I was the one that was blessed. Or maybe um, it's, you know, volunteering with our uh, kids in Waomba or Upstreet and you're thinking, I don't even have kids and I'm not even sure I know how to deal with kids, but you know, I I'll do it, but God, you're going to have to help me. And you saw your faith grow through that or, or maybe leading a, a life group and see, when that happens, we have to realize that there is more at risk than we realize. Because like I said, you go to be a blessing and it's not about that. You know, it's about building up your faith. You go to meet a need and, you know, that need could have been met many other ways. And, you know, maybe God could have done it all by himself, I'm sure. But God allowed you to be a part of it in a personal ministry so that your faith could grow. There's this incredible story from the book of Matthew, the first, uh, the first book of the New Testament. And it's a story I'm sure you're familiar with, the feeding of the 5,000. And it illustrates this idea so powerfully. Um, Jesus, to kind of give you some background and some context coming into that story, Jesus had just been informed that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been beheaded by Herod. And to make it even worse, Herod did this really gruesome thing and he served um, John the Baptist's head on a platter at his dinner party. And so, um, you know, this was Herod, the son of Herod, that actually tried to kill Jesus as a baby. That was this Herod's father. And so this was Herod the Tetrarch, had just killed Jesus' cousin, um, his front runner, a, a godly man, a prophet. So Jesus is feeling all that grief, all those emotions. And then this is where we pick up in the story. It says that as soon as Jesus heard that news, that he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed him on foot from many towns because Jesus was really getting popular at that time and people were coming in crowds. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. So even with all this grief and exhaustion that Jesus was feeling, he still kind of pushed through it and went out and ministered to the people the whole day to the point where, you know, it was heading towards evening time. And it says that evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. It's already getting late send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary. You feed them. So the disciples asked Jesus to do something, to send the people home, to send the crowds home. And then Jesus turns it around and says, no, I think you need to do something and ask them to feed this huge crowd. Well, here's the connection between that story and us. And this is how it applies with us because as a Christian, you have been given certain gifts and abilities that you'll have opportunities throughout your faith experience to, to serve others, to use those talents and gifts to, to serve in some ministry capacity. Um, you know, and it may not just be the feeling of guilt or because the pastor hung yelled for you to lead a group or whatever it is, but you just really feel like God is nudging you and, and this is something that you need to do, but you hesitate. And, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But it could be like, you know, those women that I work with, I've been thinking about, you know, maybe having a Bible study with them at work or just kind of getting together and being there for them. And, you know, but I don't know. Or, um, 
you know, every time you hear us talk about Inside Out and our, you know, ministry with high school students, you think, wow, you know, wouldn't it be great if somehow I could be a part of it and, you know, those kids wouldn't have the same high school experience that I had. Maybe I could save them from that, but I'm pretty busy and I just don't know. And so we, we have this, this pushback. You know, Jesus is saying, like he said to the disciples, um, you, you give them something to eat. You know, it may be that you were asked to lead a life group and you think, I don't, you know, I'm not a Bible expert and, you know, people might ask me a difficult question. What do I do then? You know what all that tension is? That's your faith muscles being stretched. That's your faith growing. You know, because you're saying things like, do I really trust God that much? Do I really believe that I'm going to do my part and then trust that God's going to come in and fill in the rest of it? Um, you know, when people step out of their comfort zones and serve in a ministry capacity, the two things that always surface are fear and inadequacy. Those are, those are normal. Uh, you know, who am I going to be to tell somebody else how they need to live their life? So here the disciples stand, wondering what to do. Jesus says, no, they, don't send them away. You feed them. They had no idea what was behind all this, what hung in the balance, what the bigger picture was. But they said, okay, you know, we got a few loaves of bread. We got a few fish here. You know, in, in our economy, that's not going to feed all these people, but we're going to do it. And God, you're going to have to kind of come into this somehow. And they did. Do you think they ever forgot what happened that day? You know the story that, you know, 5,000 people were fed. They had food left over. I don't think they ever forgot that day. They're probably like, oh my gosh, did you see that happen? And wow, you know, I think their faith soared. And that happens with, with us as well. I mean, immediately God puts them on a boat, sends them out to do uh, another impossible thing, hoping that they would remember the lesson that they had just learned. And so he sends them out onto the lake and they're rowing across the lake. He said, you guys go ahead. And they're rowing into the wind, which is very, very difficult. So they, you know, it's difficult. They're tired. They're, you know, trying to get across the lake. And then all of a sudden, here walks Jesus on the lake. Well, Peter notices him and, you know, they were scared. But Peter says, hey, um, I think I know how this works. You know, I really didn't see how the 5,000 thing was going to happen. But you made that happen. That was a miracle. And... Um, and we just trusted you. So, Lord, if you call me onto the water, I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll trust you. And so Jesus called Peter and Peter stepped out into the water. But then the story tells us that Peter started focusing less on Jesus and more on the waves and the, the wind. And it began to sink. And the story says that Jesus reached out and grabbed Peter and says, You have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? So here's these regular men that went through the same feelings of fear and inadequacy like we do. And guess what? Later in the story, Jesus stands on a hillside and he hands over the, the leadership and the responsibility of the entire Christian movement to these men who are still in process because their faith was maturing. You know, Everybody stands at a crossroads like that at one point or another. I mean, I, I'm not the example. I, I feel like my faith is still growing. But I'll remember the, I remember the day 27 years ago when we decided, Sarah Lee and I, to quit our jobs in the U.S. And, you know, could have been moving up in the career pretty well by now, I would guess. But we felt that God was leading us to come to Cebu and do some type of ministry. We were scared. We felt inadequate. We didn't know what to do, but we felt the nudging and we decided to trust God. And God has done so many incredible things that are way beyond us over the years. Started Quest and 16 years ago when we started Quest, we're like, we've never started a church before. We're not sure we're, we know what we're doing, but it was very, very clear that God wanted us to do that during that season. And we trusted God and God filled in the gaps. And many of you are here today because of that. Um, like I said, some of you maybe were serving in Upstreet or Waomba and didn't know what to do with kids, but you got out there and God showed up. Or 
you, you were working with high school students or leading a small group and felt inadequate and felt the fear and I'm with you. Um, but you trusted God and you did what you could do and then God stepped in and did the part that only he can do. Um, nobody knows what hangs in the balance when we step out in faith. You know, I'll tell you one thing that hangs in the balance is the maturity of your faith and very often the maturity of somebody else's faith. I mean, aren't you glad that somebody, you know, whenever that was in, in your past and back in your faith story, that somebody pushed through their fear and in inadequacy and decided to invite you to church or to that Bible study, or maybe they told you about their relationship with Christ, they introduced you to Christ. Aren't you glad that they did that because you know, we were all somebody's personal ministry at some point. Uh, aren't you glad if you're a parent that somebody has done that so that your kids could grow in their faith? Somebody set aside their fear or inadequacy to serve as a small group leader for our kids or for our teenagers? I remember the, the young people that did that and had an impact on my kids' lives when they were growing up. I mean, nobody ever feels fully equipped to work with high school students. Nobody ever feels fully comfortable when they start to lead a life group for the first time. But see, personal ministry enables us to see God's power, experience God's power in the middle of our weaknesses. And as your pastor, I want that so bad for you because I know if you can just take that step, you can just push beyond that fear and inadequacy that God is going to use that situation incredibly to grow your faith. And as your faith grows, your faith soars, your Heavenly Father is honored as well. It's kind of like the time you remember when, when you first learned how to ride a bike or you learned how to swim. Maybe for a few of you, maybe it was learning to ride a horse. And that first time you got on a bike, the first time you were told to jump in the water, you were scared to death, but somebody was standing there and said, just trust me, just trust me. And think about all of the life that you have enjoyed because you pushed through that, because you stepped out in faith you know, to that person that was helping you out. And I, you know, I remember this guy that still comes to Quest to this day, and this is probably more than 10 years ago, probably 12 years ago, that his wife was wanting him to come to church. He didn't feel like it was his thing. He didn't feel like he was going to fit in or meet anybody that was like him. First thing he came to was a ministry opportunity. We were giving Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes up in the mountains. And so he decides to come and help out and be a part. That was his connection point. He met people that day. He saw, you know, his service and the people's lives that were touched, but then it turned around and it, it did something in his heart too. It grew his faith. That was probably his entry point in faith. And ever since then, in many opportunities, that guy's faith still continues to grow. So what is God asking of you in terms of this whole idea of personal ministry? I mean, God is most honored when we have a big faith, when we have a confidence in Him. Remember the very first week I said that back in the Garden of Eden, the relationship between God and man was, was severed because of a lack of trust. But you know what? That relationship explodes and grows when we rebuild that trust by rebuilding our faith. See, for the rest of your life, you're going to see these five things play out in the background of your faith experience. And there may be more than five, but these five are pretty common and they're pretty obvious they're gonna happen. So you need to make sure that you're in environments where you are exposed to practical teaching, the Bible taught in a way where you can apply it and use it in your life. You, you need to, uh, to establish the discipline in your life of the, of prayer and Bible study and giving and, and those things, because even though they're done in private, God somehow just really, really grows your faith as you connect with him through those private disciplines. 
providential relationships, maybe you need to be in a group because that's, uh, you know, to be in community around the right kind of people that are also trying to grow is a place where a lot of times those providential relationships can happen. But we also need to be available that God might want us to be that providential relationship for somebody else. And, and then just realize these pivotal circumstances, things happen in life. And sometimes they're crushing. Sometimes they are, they, you know, we're almost tempted to lose our faith, but reframe those to realize that God may very well be in this to grow my faith, the pivotal circumstance. And then lastly, the personal ministry to work beyond your fear, work beyond your inadequacy, knowing that you're going to do your part. God's going to step in in some way that I don't even know I can fully explain and your faith is going to grow because there was a lot more about that whole scenario than just you serving and doing something. So God wants you to have a big faith. I want you to have a big faith. Now you know how it happens. So um, hope you've benefited from learning these things and now you can see them happen. Now you can make sure you're in the right places and maybe adjusting your perspective, maybe private disciplines is something you need to work on. And it's not a checklist that you check off and say, okay, well, I did that. I can move on. These are things that are always at play in the background of our faith. Let me pray for you right now. Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you that you desire for us to have a big faith, you know, not just because it honors you, but certainly because it helps us to get through life that, you know, you don't want this to be something that just happens on Sundays but you want it to be something that affects and impacts our everyday life. Because, you know, if our faith doesn't change our life, then it's useless. And so, God, we want to have a big faith. I pray for the people out there that, uh, that need this. Um, Lord, I, I need this reminder every few years of, of what's going on in the background. Because, you know, there are times that we feel like you're doing something to us when the reality is you're doing something in us. So God, grow our faith. Help us to have a big faith, even in the midst of this pandemic. And we know that through that, you will be honored and glorified. So give us wisdom to know how we move forward with all this and make sure this happens in our life and uh, give us the courage to take the steps that we need to take. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's about it for our time today. We hope that you found our series helpful and don't forget to make use of the discussion questions that we'll put up in just a minute. Although our services are online during this pandemic, the church is not closed. We still continue to meet needs in our community and we couldn't do it without your help. If you consider Quest your church, we encourage you to continue your giving and we have several online options available. You can go to our website at give.questcebu.com. Click it and it will give you options on how to give. Next Sunday, we start a new series with, with Pastor Andy Stanley entitled, The Messy Middle. Hmm, that sounds interesting. Thanks again for spending time with us and don't forget to share our content with your friends and family. If there is anything we can pray with you about, please text us at 0917-707-8378 or send us a direct message here on Facebook. God bless you and your family. Stay safe and we'll see you back online this Wednesday evening for our midweek prayer and next Sunday for our online Sunday service. See you soon and bye for now.